Thank you, Senator Daines. I am often reminded this time of year of, of again, the value of things like the, the avalanche monitoring, um, whether it's in Montana, Colorado, Alaska. We have a lot of us are skiers. I'm not the backcountry skier that my, my, my sons are, but making sure that there is an understanding of avalanche, avalanche uh, extreme conditions, and just how you, how you are safe in the outdoors is something that we can never overtrain or over prepare for. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I want to ask a few questions. I, <clears throat> I love the fact that I get the gavel, <laughs> which some would say that means you have to stay for the whole hearing, and that means I get to stay for the whole hearing. So uh, I have a whole series of, of questions that I'd like to engage you all in, if we may. And this relates to, 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 the, to the warnings, the early warnings that we're talking about um, that can help people get to higher ground if there is a tsunami coming or, uh, uh, again, how we alert people. And there have been a whole series of, of articles that have come out post the, the earthquake last week. Um, uh, there was the, the discussion about the, the buoy that uh, showed a big wave. Why in Alaska a buoy showed a big wave that wasn't there? The case of the phantom tsunami. You have the buoy monitoring systems out there that register one thing. Uh, the how the communication is is shared. I was woken up uh, on Tuesday morning to a phone that was just wild with communication from friends all over Alaska. Uh, but I got not only the tsunami warning um, that, uh, that came from I guess it was the. Alaskalandmine.com, I don't know where that one comes from, but from the Tsunami Warning Center, uh, I've got one here from my Quake feed that gives me the, the magnitude of the different quakes afterwards and the timing, uh, the emergency alert that I received, um, and then the chatter that goes on invariably that goes on because we all have access to these. And the last one was, and this was not an official one, this was friend alert, just heard Kodiak channel is empty. So the, the swirl of news and kind of the, the, uh, the, the, the not so news that is, is shared that causes anxiety, panic, uh, at times, um, and real fear is something that I think from an emergency management perspective, we all want to make sure that the information that we're communicating is accurate and almost as instantaneous as we can make it. Uh, in one of, the, one of the articles that I was reading about, and this goes to, to your comments, Dr. West, about collaboration between the agencies a discussion about parts of the um, emergency alert system that failed. You've got the National Tsunami Warning Center there in Palmer. You've got the intersect with the National Weather Service. Uh, you have some the, the MNET, the Emergency Management Network, state contracts for that service. IPAWS, or the Inter Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, is run by the federal government. So you've got lots of things going on at the same time. It's my understanding, and we'll learn more, um, certainly about the emergency um, uh, alert system and where we saw failures there. Mayor Branson, you mentioned that um, we got lucky here with this, that we did not have a tsunami. But it certainly woke the people of Kodiak up, and uh, I, I talked with the mayor of the Aleutians East Borough. I know down in Sand Point in King Cove, folks heard the sirens, went through the drill, went to higher ground. Y you could say it was, it was a, a really good trial run um, in which we learned a lot and nobody was hurt. Uh, but 
I'd like to hear, and I'll, I'll, I'll open this up to, to all of you here, in terms of how, how we can do a better job with the communication that goes on. Um, I understand, Dr. West, that, that some of Alaska's earthquake monitors were actually offline at the time of the quake last week. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to know about how that impacted anything, but also the, the steps that we go through to notify emergency managers and the, and the partnerships uh, with NOAA when we have a tsunami warning, an earthquake warning, um, how are we doing and what do we need to be doing better? Because I, I think about your statement, Mayor Branson, that Tuesday, or excuse me, Wednesday at two o'clock, everybody just hears the sirens and they, they think, oh, it's two o'clock. They don't think about tsunami. They think it's two o'clock. Um, we don't want people to get numb to the, the drills. Um, but we also don't want to overly concern people. It's a fine line there. So if we can just begin the discussion there, and I'll let anyone jump in. Dr. Applegate, you want to start? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> no, this is, uh, it, you know, it's about getting the right information to the right people at the right time. And, and that has, is made more uh, uh, complex by the fact that communication is no longer just a, a one way from the emergency manager right. you know, to the folks. There's all of that um, uh, in, interaction person to person. One of the things that we've found is the criticality of delivering our information um, in, in multiple streams. Um, so for example, uh, we actually will use uh, the Twitter feeds. Um, we both collect information as people, uh, you know, they, they will themselves be, you know, feeling the shaking. You can actually watch the seismic waves going out as people pick that up. But we can also then inject our authoritative information into that bloodstream, as it will, of communication, because people want the authoritative information. And it's figuring out how do we make sure that we, we get it there. And, and part of that is getting it in the form, um, not just the, the alerts that go to uh, you know, emergency management, but also getting that information out there, whether it's through, through tweets or other, other means. So what, what about the concern that comes when you've spread it too far? And the example I'll use is that folks in Anchorage where my, my husband was that night, um, our home there, they get the tsunami alert. They don't need the tsunami alert in, in Anchorage, but I understand that it's, a, it's an issue where you've got a, uh, the way it was described is an, uh, an issue dealing with the intersection of weather service forecast areas and census areas. And so you, you want to err on the side of alerting more people than, than not. In other words, we don't want to fail to alert some. And so in an overabundance possibly of caution, more people get the alert. But then when you get multiple alerts and it's, quote, always a false alarm, you have people kind of tuning that out. How do we, how do we bridge that? Anybody have any ideas? Dr. West? Yeah, let me address that in maybe a somewhat positive note. But you, you've captured well that that requires the intersection of everyone from the, the, you know, the scientific community through to the, you know, the municipal level on emergency management. You, those connections are what's required. And on the tsunami side, uh, Mayor Branson had an a, a image, a, a, a graphic here showing uh, projected inundation zones in and around Kodiak. Uh, that's actually a brand new publication that came out in September of this year, updated to specifically incorporate the lessons learned during the uh, Japan earthquake, which uh, uh, Mr. Norman uh, referenced. Um, that's actually a really dynamic, vibrant, new uh, 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 study, if you will, made possible by a program that was slated year after year for being cut until the Tsunami Warning Education Reauthorization Act was passed 
uh, again last year. That group of emergency managers, scientists, and community folks is meeting right now in Seattle. Most all the tsunami scientists in this country are in Seattle right now. I wish uh, Senator Cantwell were here uh, for that. But they're, they're gathering a once annual meeting to specifically address those kinds of issues. So while it is not solved at all, and there are, I, th I think the Anchorage alert issue is, uh, highlights some of the challenges and the, the hyper-connectedness of all these different communication channels that you see on your phone and certainly folks like the USGS uh, grapple with at an operational level. Uh, while we certainly don't have those uh, all figured out, it's the existence of programs like that, the continued existence year in and year out that builds those relationships that are needed. It was fascinating to sit, uh, 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 Mayor Branson and I met yesterday, and it was fascinating to debrief her views of this event last week. She has a particular sphere of knowledge and influence which is very different than mine, and uh, finding those points of intersection, but that takes kind of, that takes forced collaboration. It's, it is an issue that, again, I think um, we, we, learn from, um, we learn from these events. We've learned not only from this, uh, this event, earthquake, potential tsunami in Alaska, but when we think about the alert that the people of Hawaii faced uh, about a month, well, a little less than a month ago now, <laughs> um, a different kind of alert, not a natural hazard, um, but a but a very uh, a, a very threatening alert to the public. And when we think about these emergency uh, systems that that broadcast to to communities, um, uh, trying to do early warning again, making sure that there is a a a an accuracy, but also um, a, a timeliness is, is something that um, I think we recognize is absolutely critical. I wanted to um, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Applegate, and this is kind of a follow up on Senator Wyden's question, because I I I, I believe that. He was trying to, to get to the adequacy of, of the funding issue for, for earthquakes and, uh, and warning systems. But it's my understanding that what we're doing with um, earthquake early warning is a system that is not yet up and operational all throughout. It's been tested in Washington, Oregon, and California. I understand that it's being used in Japan, but it is not a system that is fully implemented and in place. I, I, I don't think it's being used in Alaska, is it, Dr. West? No. So, so is that, what is the status of the earthquake early warning, and how is that different than what, what we're monitoring currently when it comes to, to our earthquakes. Sure. So a, a key for about earthquake early warning, it is built on our existing monitoring capabilities. And essentially sure. is can we get a dense enough network and fast enough computing and algorithm and telemetry and all of those pieces to be able to beat the strong shaking. So it, a, a key point is that it is an extension, it's a new tool, it's a new capability that is built and requires that existing investment on our current monitoring capabilities. Um, there are a number of countries that have deployed um, earthquake early warning systems. Japan is the most advanced and has had, had it in place for a number of years, uh, but there's several other countries as well. We have a prototype system for the, for the West Coast, for the California through, through Washington, that is currently in a sort of a beta, beta test phase. There's some uh, use by test users, for example, the Bay Area Rapid Transit uh, system. Um, area, users for whom um, at this point, uh, uh, like a false alarm isn't a big problem. They slow the trains down for lots of reasons, right? So there's one, there's a use that can have a fairly high tolerance for, uh, for, a, uh, uh, for, a, for a missed alert. On the other hand, there are lots of other uses that you need to have that fully developed uh, system. So we're very much in a prototype phase. It is, so it is not something that is 
broadly publicly available yet. It is a system being built, but the key is it's being built on top of that existing monitoring and Does it's it strengthening. Does it work well in Japan where it is fully implemented? Absolutely. In, in Japan, I think a good example would be the, um, so the, ma the magnitude 9 earthquake that we've had discussed. Um, one of the capabilities with the earthquake early warning system is to slow down the bullet trains. Mm -hmm. They had, I believe, 26 bullet trains operating you know, several hundred miles an hour. They were able to slow those trains before the strong shaking arrives. They had no derailments from that event. Mm -hmm. Think of the number of folks who were on that. Um, there was a successful earthquake um, early warning. There were relatively few fatalities from the earthquake itself, but that's, of course, both a testament to the quality of their building codes, again, all of those things you do before the event, uh, quality of building codes, um, but also uh, the early warning for the, uh, for the earthquake. But you're saying that, that in order for us to move forward with a more robust early warning system, whether on, on the Pacific Northwest, Alaska, or wherever, the, the monitoring stations that we have in place are, are, are kind of the base for that. Exactly, and it's a densification of those stations, ensuring that they have the, the fastest telemetry, all of that. So it's a, it's an, an really it's an end state outcome of, of this advanced national seismic system that we're, we're building you know, in partnership with the regional seismic networks. And it would be uh, an additional capability that a, you know, a robust monitoring network can deliver on top of this sort of real time after the event, you know, so again, it's we're trying to deliver the fastest possible information, the best information that we can. Sure. 